Hey everyone, thanks again. Uh, this is the second lesson of today, Republican Rule of the 1920s. Uh, so this will just focus exclusively kind of on the government's role during the 1920s. So make sure you watch the uh, first video on uh, the Roaring Twenties, and then you can watch this one here. Um, so anyways, let's take a look and um, let's... So let's talk about our first president of the 1920s, Warren Harding. If you remember, he was elected in 1920, uh, kind of a resounding no to continued Wilsonianism, continued idealism, progressivism, and things like that. So Warren G. Harding is a Republican. He will be the first of three Republican presidents during the 1920s. Um, with his election, we're going to see really an end to progressivism. We're going to see a lot less of government role in the economy, a lot less regulation and, and things like that. I'll, I'll kind of talk about that a little bit more in a bit. Warren G. Harding, not a great president. It's actually kind of funny. At the time, he was relatively popular. And then when he died, you know, people kind of liked him, felt bad, whatever. And then Upon his death, there were a lot of scandals that kind of broke out, and so uh, his popularity was largely lost. Um, if you recall, Ulysses S. Grant, when he was elected president, he decided to put a lot of his friends in the cabinet. And in the same way, Warren G. Harding is going to do the same thing. And he's going to put a lot of his friends in kind of high places where they probably didn't belong. But similar to Grant, he had these allegiances, wanted to help his friends out, whatever else. And that's going to be problematic. His crew, mostly in the cabinet, but also big business people from the business world, corporations, etc., are referred to as the Ohio Gang. So that's the term we use to describe them. Um, it is important to realize that some of his cabinet will be actually relatively strong. Um, he does bring some people in that, you know, did have experience, were good at what they did, but they're largely going to be overshadowed. And they're going to be overshadowed by a couple of these guys. Um, Albert Fall, very, very bad, Secretary of the Interior. This guy was actually anti uh, conservat uh, conservatist. So you can imagine you're in charge of the interior. Part of the big things that you're supposed to do is conservation, and he's going to be opposed to that. So automatically, that's a serious problem. He's also going to be involved in some serious corruption schemes. Another one is uh, Harry D uh, Daughtry, the Attorney General, basically by all intents and purposes, um, a crook. So these are some of the people that are going to kind of spill problems uh, for Warren G. Harding. And similar to Grant, usually when people look back, they say it wasn't like Warren G. Harding was necessarily involved in the scandals himself, but he's going to be somebody that is going to be seen as kind of being like aloof, kind of not really being super on top of it and allowing these things to happen under his leadership, which is problematic. Look at Warren G. Harding here. And here are some of our Ohio gangs. There's Harding as well. Um, and again, these guys are going to make a lot of decisions for Warren G. Harding. Kind of take advantage of, uh, of Harding to be able to get what they want. And then this is just a reminder going back to a little bit before the start of the 20th century. Like who's been our presidents? Okay, so just a reminder. McKinley, if you remember, president... 1897-1901, Republican. Teddy, Republican. Taft, Republican. Wilson, we saw the shift, Democrat. And then watch this. Harding, 1921-1923, Republican. Coolidge, 23-29, also Republican. Hoover, 29-33, Republican as well. So look at that. First 30 plus years of the 20th century, we're going to see almost all Republicans other than the terms of Wilson, uh, but what we'll see is after Hoover, it, it's going to be a big shift, and for the next um, 20 years, there's going to be a Democrat president. So we see that that's oftentimes the way things work in the United States, where we see that shift from Democrat to Republican, that absolutely is going to happen. But in 1920s, uh, we, we see Republican rule the whole time, hence why I, I called the lesson the Republican rule of the 1920s so clever. Just kidding. Okay, so let's talk about Republican rule. So obviously, 
the president is not the only person in charge, but what are some things that are going to happen? Um, so first off, the Harding administration is going to put things into play to advocate for uh, laissez-faire economics. If you recall, this just means hands-off. So that kind of government control, government regulation is largely going to be lifted. So it's a good time. It's going to be a good time for business and corporations. Harding only serves for a little over two years. We'll talk about his death um, but he'll be responsible for the appointment of four Supreme Court justices. So what that means is the Supreme Court in their decision making will take definitely a conservative tone and a conservative nature. Um, it's with also a Republican Congress, Republican President, Republican Supreme Court. We will largely see the end to progressive legislation. So this will include things like child labor laws, not going to be continued. Um, many of the gains that have been made of labor as far as unions and working hours and things will largely be stripped away as well. Um, even, you know, again, the big thing, you know, government intervention, government regulation of the economy will also largely uh, dismantle. So this is not a good time for government intervention in the economy, but it's probably telling of uh, the way the American people felt in the 1920s. You know, and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Things were good, at least on the surface. So people didn't want the government stepping in. People don't really like that. So that's exactly what's going to happen. Um, Atkins versus Children's Hospital. This is actually very interesting, and it's actually what's being depicted by the political cartoon. If you recall, there was an earlier Supreme Court decision Moeller versus Oregon that had given special protection to women in the workplace, including a specific minimum wage and working hours. Those are going to be stripped away in Atkins versus Children's Hospital. No special protection for women in the workplace. Invalidation of the minimum wage law for women, basically saying, hey, you know what? Women got the right to vote, so they're equal to men. They don't need to be protected by um special legislation. Um, many problems, by the way, with that argument, most notably the fact that, well, just because they had the right to vote does not mean women in the 1920s were anything close to equal to men. But again, showing the government really kind of wanted to step away here, not um, harness big business, big corporations, and those type of things. There are going to be antitrust laws that existed. They're just largely not going to be enforced very much. And so businesses and corporations will be able to expand. Good time for big business in this kind of atmosphere as they also are subjected to tax cuts. And again, they don't have to um, do a lot with the labor unions and those type of things. Again, the big businesses will never expand to the level they were going back to uh, like the late 1800s, but they are definitely not going to be harnessed and restricted like during the times of the progressive presidencies of Teddy, of Taft, and of Wilson. So let's talk about our workers after the war. So what's going to exactly happen with them? What happens with some of the things that had taken place in the economy during the wartime? If you remember, the government had control over the economy during the war in some respects. There was the War Industry Board. There was the National uh, Labor Board, which was designed to settle uh, labor disputes between unions. And what we're going to see is rest in peace. Okay, Those things are going to go away. Things that had gone under government control during the wartime are going to go to private control. So that's what's going to happen there. Labor gains from wartime, if you recall... Workers had seen wage increases. They had been given special rights as far as the ability to, um, you know, working days and conditions and things like that. Those are also going to go away as, you know, big businesses, big corporations are going to be allowed to largely do what they want as far as they're dealing with labor. Uh, wage cuts are going to be experienced for a lot of workers. Um, so that's obviously not good. And also what we're going to see is a pretty heavy decrease in union membership. Some of this has to do with the first Red Scare, but about 30% decrease from the 1910s to the 1920s as far as union membership as less and less people decide to be part of workers' union. 
The one kind of thing that will happen during the Harding administration that would be seen as good for the common person is going to be the creation of the Veterans Bureau. Basically, hospitals, uh, rehab, other types of things for our disabled veterans. And we'll also see the creation of the American Legion. This is basically a lobbying group that is created to lobby for veteran benefits. And these um, organizations will be successful in getting compensation for veterans. Both in 1922 and 1924, all veterans that served in World War I will get some additional compensation. And that's always an interesting thing. It's something that the government still does today. It's kind of like, how do you thank those that sacrificed their life for the war? So uh, this is kind of that start of basically saying, hey, we got to make sure we take care of these people. This, by the way, is Charles Forbes. He's actually going to be our first um, head of the Veterans Bureau under the Harding administration. We're actually going to talk about him in a few minutes in a not-so-positive way as he's going to be part of Harding's administration that's going to be wrapped up in some uh, corruption problems. Okay, so let's talk about uh, Harding and his foreign policy and kind of what is going on. Well, if you recall... After World War I, the United States definitely decides to move into isolation. Nothing's clearer than that than the decision not to ratify the Treaty of Versailles. But this is going to be complicated during the 1920s, which is that the U.S. has moved itself into the world power category. So it's really hard to be isolationist, and it's really hard to you know say you're just going to do your own thing when you're a world power. So that is going to be hard for the United States to do, and it's not necessarily going to be fully possible. If you recall, the United States will not ever become part of the League of Nations, but when the League of Nations meets, the United States sends some observers, in quotes, uh, to the League of Nations. And this is basically them trying to kind of Get some inside scoop. You know, what's this organization all about? You know, what's going on here? What are they trying to do? And in this way, they're still trying to semi-be involved, but not really. The other thing that's kind of interesting is because the Congress never ratified the Treaty of Versailles because they didn't want to be part of the League of Nations, technically when Harding took over, the United States was still at war with Germany and Austria and Hungary and the the Central Powers. So one of the things that Harding's going to have done is get a joint resolution passed by Congress to end the war. So again, it's more formality than anything else. They weren't actually fighting. But at the same time, it's kind of embarrassing. You know, two, three years after the war, they still technically haven't signed the peace treaty. So they're going to sign a separate treaty with Congress specifically. Another thing that's going to happen here is the United States is going to look at the situation in the Middle East as oil becomes an increasingly important um, commodity for um, Americans, and they're going to make the decision here to have U.S. oil companies go to the Middle East and start um, basically exploiting oil. So not exactly great, but the United States trying to advance themselves at least economically internationally. Okay, even though the United States does not become part of the League of Nations, they are going to be involved in something that is worth note. And you just want to remember something, which is that World War I was terrible. 10 million deaths worldwide, uh, another 20 million injured, then millions more dying in the flu epidemic of uh, Spanish flu. And so there's kind of this overarching attitude that there should never be another war again. And the Treaty of Versailles was kind of designed to do that, but going to be very, very unsuccessful. The United States is going to be somewhat part of this as they are going, they, and, and really all these powers are going to push disarmament. Basically, everyone has too many ships, too many weapons, too many tools of war, and everyone needs to disarm. So the United States is going to send an invitation for all the countries to come to Washington, D.C. in 1921 for what is known as the Washington Com Conference. And they send it to all the major powers, not including Russia, the United States still not even acknowledging that as a legitimate country under the rule of communism. 
and a few things out of this conference that they're trying to achieve. Number one, they really want all the countries to stop constructing battleships. Say, listen, you know, these are tools of war. You need to not do that. And then another thing they do is they're going to say, okay, with what you have as far as uh, battleships, aircraft carriers, etc., let's establish a ratio so there's parity. And that ratio is 5-5-3. Five, five, the U.S. and Britain to have the most, about 500,000 tons uh, of naval tonnage. And then Japan at the three. Um, so uh, less, obviously, for them. Not entirely fair, but the U.S. is going to try to say, hey, look, we have all this naval tonnage right now. Britain does as well, so we should be the top. Japan, even at this ratio, this would allow you to still, you know, be at a pretty good spot. So I think this will kind of maintain the current ratio is what they're going to say. Uh, there'll be some debate back and forth, but this will be agreed in with the Washington Naval Treaty, which is going to be signed as a result of this, which largely does what was established here to, to do and set out. So it seems like a success, right? Eh, let's be cautious. The reason why is because it only puts limits on battleships. No restraints on small ships. No restraints on submarines. So these countries will continue to do that. Japan is not going to be thrilled about their you know, ratio being less. And that's going to lead to some resentment there. So it's really not as good as had been hoped. But it's something... Um, another thing that the United States, and this will come out a little bit later, is going to be one of the main countries responsible for is known as the Kellogg-Briand Pact. This is a pact also between uh, 60 of the 62 countries of the world in the, 19, uh, in the later 1920s. And what this pact is designed to do is to outlaw war. What it says is, hey, look, no country can go to war unless um, it's a defensive war. Well, okay. I would just say this. This is pretty dumb. First off, no enforcement here of the kellogg Briand Pact. Also, any country that wants to go to war can always justify going to war because they're on the defensive. So this is not going to be very, very successful. So, you know, again, two kind of attempts here to try to advance world peace, both of which will fall relatively short. Here, by the way, we see the countries of the world at the Washington Conference. This, by the way, a political cartoon showing the naval ratio, Britain, the United States, and then followed by Japan. Uh, by the way, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, signed by most established nations in the world, August 27, 1928, and is still in effect today, according to international and U.S. law. Yeah, again, um, 1928, we've had several wars since then throughout the world, so not exactly a winner there. Just a little meme, you know, 28, we ban war. How'd that work out? Eh, not so hot. Okay, let me talk about another issue, and this is something I'll just kind of get on a little bit here, and then I'm going to expand a lot more on um, into next week when we get into the Wall, uh, Wall Street crash and the uh, Great Depression, and that's the tariff issue. This is something that just doesn't go away. If you recall, one of the things that had happened under Wilson is he was able to lower the tariff but increase taxes on especially the wealthy. And they said, okay, this is how we're going to make sure that you know more common people are not going to be so badly impacted by the tariff. Well, Harding is going to lower taxes on the wealthy, as will the um, Republican administrations of Coolidge and, and Hoover a little bit as well. So what that means is that you have to look for another source of revenue. And also a reminder that the United States is kind of being selfish in the 1920s. They're focused on Americanism, so they have no problem with a high tariff. And so they're going to do that with a new tariff that's going to come to place in 1922, the Forty McCumber Tariff Law. This increases the tariff from the uh, average tariff, again, every good is different, to roughly 38.5%. Before this, this is about 27 So you can see it's a pretty dramatic difference. The other thing that's interesting to look at is that this tariff law gives a flexibility on rates. And what it says is, hey, look, there's actually, for individual goods, there's flexibility. We can 
increase or decrease the rate depending on the good and access to it in the United States, you know, all these other factors. Well, that would seem okay. No, not really. Many items will have tariff increases. Very few will have tariff decreases. So this ultimately is not a very good thing um, for those that are advocating for a lower tariff as the tariff does increase here. One of the things that makes this complicated is that the European economies are really, really suffering throughout the uh, 1920s from World War I. And the United States placing a high tariff means that it's going to be really hard for them to be able to sell their goods to the United States. And they're going to complain. They're going to say, hey, look, you got to help us out. You know, we, we're at a, a loss here. We can't really do anything. And the United States is basically going to say, too bad. The other thing that's going to happen is in retaliation, many European countries are going to raise uh, their tariff uh, on the United States. Again, anytime you get yourself into a kind of tariff war where we have countries increasing their tariffs, it's never a good thing because it really hinders uh, kind of free trade and, and those type of things. So that's not something that that's very good. And absolutely in this case, this is kind of one of those things that's going to be bad for everyone. Again, look at this uh, political cartoon for the Fordy McCumber tariff law. Notice the foreign salesmen keep out. Again, exactly what's going to happen here. Okay, to be honest, more than anything else, the Harding administration today is known for their heavy amounts of scandals. So, unfortunately, that's just the truth. But let me break down some of these scandals for you so you can see kind of how corrupt things were. Uh, Charles Forbes, I showed you a picture of him before. This is him again. If you remember, he was the head of the Veteran Affairs. Well, he's going to be caught stealing about $200 million that was supposed to go towards building Veterans Hospital and keeping it for himself. So he's going to be going to jail. Okay, again, blatant corruption, uh, not helping your veterans out, but nonetheless, Talk about harding and kind of a lack of oversight and putting people into positions of power that probably don't belong. The most notorious uh, scandal that happens under Harding is the Teapot Dome scandal. Teapot Dome was an oil reserve in Wyoming, and it was reserved for the U.S. Navy. And what happened here is that Albert Fall, if you remember, he was the Secretary of the Interior, he convinced the Secretary of the Navy to transfer the property over to his interior department. And then, after that, he leased the land, loaded with oil and things like that, uh, for personal profit. Okay, so again, um, that's obviously very, very serious and very, very bad. This is oil reserves for the Navy that now is being used for personal profit. Um, he will also go to jail once this whole thing comes out. Um, people really, by the way, disturbed by this. Some more scandals will emerge uh, during this kind of period, some more later on. And again, what we would say is that Harding, more than anything else, was aloof, just not really paying attention um, and allowing these things to happen under him. But that being said, Harding was really relatively popular guy. He knew some of his image had been kind of hurt and the image of the administration had been hurt. So what he decided to do was in 1923 to go on a speech making tour. And as he did, he died actually up in San Francisco. And so with that being the case, now all of a sudden we have kind of a dramatic shift as we move to Harding's vice president, who's going to be Cal Coolidge. Here's a look again of uh, Forbes. Um, Again, Veteran Affairs. And here, by the way, a political cartoon highlighting the Teapot Dome oil scandal. And here we see the headline, Harding dies a stroke at 7.30. Calvin Coolidge is uh, president. Uh, again, pretty dramatic, 57 years old. Um, but nonetheless, again, um, what, what happened here? Okay, so let's talk about our next Republican president, Harding's VP, thrust into action uh, on the sudden death of Harding. Uh, someone asked this, they said, you know, in the, in the one from yesterday that, you know, like, why did they call him Silent Cow? Literally, it's as simple as that 
he just didn't say a whole lot. And he had these moments where he just kind of of silence and things like that, where he just wasn't a big talker and all those kind of things. So he got this nickname, Silent Cal. So kind of an interesting thing. Um, Cal from the New England area, grew up in Vermont and then had settled over in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, known as hardworking guy, pretty serious. Um, and again, known for these kind of random moments of silence where it's almost one of those things, if you ever heard this expression, it's like, if you don't have anything to say, just don't say anything. You know, if you don't know, just don't say anything. And Cal, I think, took that pretty seriously. So he was kind of seen as being smart when he held his tongue. Uh, very conservative. So we're going to see a lot of the same stuff happen under uh, Cal that did under Harding. Like, you know... Not a lot of government regulation of the economy, not a lot of government oversight, not a lot of government spending, and definitely advocating for big business and big corporation. Um, Cal's going to have a somewhat of a tough task. He's going to be responsible for trying to restore the American people's faith in government and in the White House, which obviously, after all those scandals of Harding, is not going to be a very easy task. But for the most part, he's going to be relatively successful. Um, he will win in 1924 by his own accord in a pretty big election. Democrats split, by the way, but either way, uh, once again showing that in 1924, the American people uh, still want to continue with the 1920s. They still see that prosperity happening, and so that's what we want to kind of look at there. Here again is Cal, our 30th president. And here, by the way, is our electoral map from 1924. Uh, Democrats, by the way, going to split between Davis and then uh, Fighting Bob uh, La Follette. That's why he only picks up his home state of Wisconsin in the green. And then you can see here, popular vote. Um, even though the Democrat, there's the Democrat split, and there's technically three candidates, uh, Coolidge does win over 50% by his own right in the popular vote, about 54%. And then Electoral College vote really um, gains the vast majority, almost three quarters. Um, so again, showing the sentiments and feelings of the American people. Okay, so let's talk about a group of people that are having some problems. This is a group of people that have been having some problems for a while, and they are our farmers. So let me tell you what's kind of going on and happening with them. Uh, if you recall, farmers had done well during the war because of all the people, like soldiers, that needed to be fed. They had a, an ability to grow and sell a lot. They were also growing and selling their products overseas. That now is going to go away. So that obviously is going to be no good. Um, again, with that de uh, demand gone, that means that they're not going to be able to have as big of a market as before. And that's going to be incredibly problematic. The other thing, though, is that the farmers aren't uh, going to be 100% helping themselves as they're going to have an overabundance of crops. And again, if you have too much of something and there's not enough demand, then the price is going to be relatively low, and that's exactly what's going to happen here. The other, But again, remember, it's the 1920s. Farmers are trying to cash in on that prosperity just like anyone else. So again, that's kind of a problem, though, for them as they try to move through this. The other thing that you want to realize is that there's a whole bunch of new technology that is going to help the lives of tractors. So, sorry, a farmer. So, for example, the tractor, gas tractor um, operated. What that means is that you can now um, farm more land and those type of things. Well, that's not always a good thing because what it means is that farmers are going to be trying to grow so much that they're going to kind of destroy the land. They're going to overwork it. And so that's one of the reasons why, like especially in our big farming hubs of the Midwest, there's going to be major problems in the late 20s, early 30s, and that's going to spell even more problems for farmers there. Government's going to do a little for farmers, but not a whole lot. Um, but the biggest thing that I'd say is uh, the McNary uh, hogan bill, basically allowing the high prices because of the government ability to buy up surpluses and then sell abroad. So again, it's not huge, but it's at least something that's going to be for the benefit of um, farmers. 
This, by the way, is one of our 1920s new tractors. Again, a farmer could use this to on a whole bunch more land than ever before, but that's not necessarily going to be a good thing. Okay, in the realm of foreign policy, we're also going to see a lot of continuity with what was established during Harding. So let me kind of make some comments here in that regard. Continued isolation, but also again, this whole kind of predicament because you're a world power, so how real isolated can you be? And then the one area that we definitely do not see isolation from the United States throughout the 1920s is continued interventions in the Central Latin America region. Um, if you recall, they're still going to be in Haiti. They'll be in Haiti till 1934. Uh, Cal takes troops out of Nicaragua for a couple years, but then puts them back. They'll be there till 1933. Um, so again, uh, this is all kind of the big thing that's going to occur um, when we talk about foreign policy. One of the big things that's going to be a problem for the United States has to do with loans they had uh, given out during World War I. Now, here's kind of a really interesting thing, but it kind of shows you, you know, this, uh, yeah, in some degree, the selfishness of the United States. The United States had lent out all this money to the Allied powers during the war, and in the 1920s, they expected it back. Well, Britain and France basically were unable to pay. Their economies really stifled by the war, not doing very well. They actually wanted their loans canceled uh, by the United States, basically saying, hey, look, you guys should see this as like a war expense. You know, we fought for three years before you guys got in. We had all these men that died. You guys came in at the la later on. You guys had not nearly the amount of people died. You know, this seems kind of unfair. The United States basically going to say, no, okay, we need the money back. All right, we're, we're not going to, you know, make any excuses here. Britain and France not happy, but the other thing that Britain and France are going to argue as well is they're going to say, hey, look, we would pay, okay, fine, but we can't pay you because the Germans are supposed to pay us because of the Treaty of Versailles. They're supposed to pay reparations, but they're not paying them as well. And if you recall from world history, this is a period of total chaos, total panic, really bad stuff for Germany as far as their economic situation, really on the verge of crisis. And actually, to be honest, it looked like a big crisis might emerge as France was even using military action in order to collect their loans in the early 1920s. The solution will come from this man here, Charles Dawes, and to what is called the Dawes Plan in 1924. And I have some graphs to show you this so you can understand how this works a little bit better, but the big things that you want to realize here is that this has the U.S. loaning Germany so then Germany's economy is much better. Then Germany is able to pay the reparations to Britain and France. And then Britain and France can now pay back their allied loans to the United States. So it's kind of like a triangular type process, but the United States is the key person in there. You might ask yourself, why would the United States do this? Well, I'm going to show you this, but they're going to get more money in return from pumping the money in there. So is this selfish? Yeah, at least a little bit. But as far as this world kind of debt crisis that was really looked like could take hold, it will solve the problem at least for now. So it is significant to um, kind of think that the United States, again, for as much as trying to be isolationist um, because of their you know, economic situation, it's not going to be as simple as that for them. Here, by the way, a look at the Dawes plan. So you can see here the U.S. loaning Germany. Then Germany can pay their money to that to uh, Britain and France. And then Britain and France able to pay that money back. So again, uh, this is a, you know, good for the U.S.'s financial uh, situation. And again, here's another look there um, on how this is looking. Um, so again, you know, an interesting way to do this, but you can see the United States really the glue holding this all together. Okay, I want to talk about Hoover for just a little bit in the election of 1928. But again, I'm trying to kind of emphasize the mindset of the American people throughout the 1920s and what they did as far as the 
their voting is, is kind of representative. So anyways, the Republicans are going to put up Hubert Hoover for presidential nomination in 1928. He was the Secretary of Commerce under Cal, Secretary of Commerce under Harding, been in government for a while, seemed like kind of the logical choice um, as far as this Republican continuation. Democrats, once again divided, can't really figure out who to put up, but they know they don't want to split the ticket because when you split the ticket, you know, you're know you destined for failure. So they're going to put up a guy by the name of Alfred Smith. And to be honest, this is probably the worst candidate they could have put up as far as electability. Why? Well, he was Catholic, he was Irish, and he was a drinker in a time of technically prohibition. And even though prohibition wasn't the most popular thing, being, you know, the president as a drinker and stuff like that would be seen as kind of unacceptable. Also Catholic, again, there's, we'll kind of talk more about this with JFK, but still a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment in the United States. A lot of fears that if a Catholic was the president, that he would be responsive to the Pope. So that was obviously seen as a problem. So all of these kind of culmination of factors are going to make Smith not electable, and Hoover will win relatively easily. Again, though, not only does Hoover win, the Republicans also win pretty easily in the Congress as well, and they take a majority there. So, again, even up to 1928, the feeling of the American people is, let's keep it going. Okay, these are great times. You know, we're under Republican leadership. This is all good stuff. Let's maintain it. You know, let's keep it going. And Hoover seems like the logical choice to do that. Let me show you this electoral uh, map and really show you what this looks like. By the way, even though Hoover does not win in the Deep South, Mississippi, Alabama, the fact that he takes other southern states as a Republican is relatively significant. So, again, showing kind of the overall victory that's able to come in here, nearly 60% of the people saying, we think times are good, let's keep it going. And again, the Electoral College even more so. Okay, I, I only want to talk about Hoover as the actual president for just a little bit, because we'll talk more about him when we get into the early depression next time but during the early hoover um presidency prosperity okay that stuff's going to kind of continue um another thing to realize is stocks still soaring okay people are investing in it and again if you're looking at the stock market as a sign of economic success then absolutely that's going to accompany the early hoover period that being said, two major groups of people that are not necessarily going to be doing that great during the Hoover presidency, that would be wage earners uh, who are not part of unions, so basically uh, factory workers, unskilled labor, and farmers who, again, we've already kind of talked about their struggles and their problems. Uh, Hoover will largely advocate for self-help. The idea here that farmers could help themselves by literally kind of coming together and doing things that would be for for their benefit. Same thing with factory workers as well. So we'll get more into this a little bit later, but this is the idea here. Like you don't need the government to come in and, and take control. Just help yourself and, and do that. The one thing that he does, and this is a picture of um, these, the, the first one is he establishes the federal farm board, which is basically going to lend money to farm organizations, uh, for like agricultural surpluses basically. Uh, but again, these are loans. This isn't like a relief package or anything like that, but at least it's a little something in order to keep things in line with the farmers. Um, the reality is Hoover, for as much government experience as he had, had been appointed to many positions. He had actually not really been elected to many positions. And so what that meant was that he didn't always play things great. And one of the big things that he said that he didn't necessarily mean was that he was going to raise the tariff. Well, again, whenever you promise something on the campaign trail or whatever else, if you don't do it, 
people start listening and paying attention. So now all of a sudden, tariffs are already high, but he's made a promise here that he's going to raise it. So this is going to lend him into some bad waters as he tries to figure out what to do. And so that will be where we start off next week um, and we look at the stock market crash into the Great Depression. Okay, thanks again so much. So here's here's some things I have for you to do as far as uh, in regards to the 1920s. So we spent a class period and then the X period going over the 1920s. So there's a 1920s graphic organizer on Google Classroom. It's designed so a copy will be made. It's Google Doc. Please complete it. Also, there's a Google form. I just want to know how's the online learning going. I'm more so concerned with this class, but also your other classes too. Um, if there's anything you know we can be doing to make this better, let me know and we can make adjustments. And our next class period will be Monday at 12.15. So again, um, that's the way this will work itself through. Okay, thanks again. Have a great day. Be sure to message me or chat or whatever else with any questions, concerns, comments you have. And thanks again.